at least are dead. 1,500 homes, businesses destroyed in the onslaught of quick-moving wildfires in Northern California. 17 large fires have burned more than 115,000 acres. The speed and intensity of the flames shocking people who live there. The wildfires have scorched properties from wineries to trailer parks, tearing through both tiny rural towns and subdivisions. Some of the largest of the fires in Napa and Sonoma counties, homes to dozens of wineries which attract tourists from all around the globe. And this is a group, the fires are already among the deadliest in California history. We will bring you the news as we get it out of it. By the way, Napa County officials, we understand specifically the sheriff's office, uh, is planning to hold a news conference at any moment. So during our hour, we'll bring you the latest on what we learn from the wildfire situation. And now we are awaiting the president's comments after meeting with Dr. Kissinger. We're told the two met on national security moments ago, so that will be brand new video uh, that will come from the president of the United States. We're told they talked about uh, the back and forth that the president has had with Senator Corker. We know that that has turned into quite a, a tweet battle, if you will. Corker announcing he will not run for re-election. The president saying he's not surprised he wouldn't uh, because he wouldn't have chosen him to do that. The two went back and forth about whether or not the president wanted him to run. I'm going going around in circles on it because they have gone around in circles about it and he was asked about it by the pool reporter. He was also asked about the situation with Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. As you know with that, Rex Tillerson was still trying a lot of diplomacy moves with North Korea. The president indicating that those aren't his only options and that he might be wasting his time, the Secretary of State. So they went back and forth uh, as well. And then the latest tweets from the president on health care. So those are the, the issues that the pool reporters asked the president about after he met on national security inside the White House with a man with so much experience in foreign policy, Dr. Henry Kissinger. We are now just moments away. Let's watch this together. Secretary Tillerson and, and the IQ, what, what were you trying to get at, sir? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Secretary, Thank you. do you worry that we're on the path to World War III? Thank you. 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 Thank no, I don't think so at all. I think we're well in a way. It's very — the people of this country want tax cuts. They want lower taxes. We're the highest taxed nation in the world. Our companies are not leaving so much now because we have them coming back. You see what happened. You see the announcements from companies building car plants now in Michigan. Uh, they're going to various different states. They're actually picking some additional locations. But just last week, five plants announced that they're going to build in this country. But I will say that we're the highest tax nation in the world. People want to see massive tax cuts. I'm giving the largest tax cuts in the history of this country. In addition to that, there'll be reform. So I think that uh, it's politically uh, — it's very positive. The people of the country want it. We're also bringing back $3 trillion from offshore. Uh, that's money that's been there for years, that wants to come back into the country. But the tax situation didn't allow it to happen, and the bureaucracy. And that's going to come back as part of the deal. Three trillion dollars. It could even be more than that. People want to see tax cuts. They want to see major reductions in their taxes. And they want to see tax reform. And that's what we're doing. And we'll be adjusting a little bit over the next few weeks to make it even stronger. But uh, I will tell you that it's become very, very popular. And I'll also be signing something probably this week, which is going to go a long way to take care of many of the people that have been so badly hurt on health care. And they'll be able to buy, they'll be able to cross state lines, and they will get great competitive health care, and it will cost the United States nothing. Take care of a big percentage of the people we're talking about, too. So uh, with Congress the way it is, I decided to take it upon myself. So we'll be announcing that soon as far as the signing is concerned. But it's largely worked out a very uh, it's very simple in one way, but very intricate in another. But it will be great, great health care for many, many people. A big percentage of the number of people that we were talking about for failed Obamacare. Now, we're going to have to do something with Obamacare because it's failing. Henry Kissinger does not want to pay 116 percent increase in his premiums, but that's what's happening. And it's actually getting worse. It's getting worse by the, by the minute. So we're going to have to do something with Obamacare, and that will work out. But very importantly, a big percentage of people will be able to get health care, and they'll be able to go across state lines. They'll be able to buy from many, many competitors. 
and meaning the insurance companies. And it will not cost our country anything, but they'll have great, great health insurance again. Did you undercut the Secretary of State today with the IQ comment? No, I didn't undercut anybody. I don't believe in undercutting people. Thank you very much, everybody. Do you still have confidence in Thank Secretary Kissinger, sir? Yes. All right, so there you have it. The President of the United States meeting with Dr. Henry Kissinger and, and making a, a comment there, kind of a funny one about health care. Hey, Henry Kissinger doesn't want to pay 116% increase for his health insurance. Let's bring it out to the couch now. We have with us House Oversight Judiciary member, uh, Congressman Ron DeSantis of the great state of Florida. Great to have you here. Um, that kind of popped up for us to, to chew on in terms of breaking news. First of all, the comments that the president was making about health care and this executive order that he's talking about. Well, it's good to be here. Congratulations to you on your show. Congratulations to you. Sam. Thank you. you guys Thank are doing you. a great Thank job. You very much. Very um, much. Look, Obamacare has all these different areas where the secretary can make all these decisions. And so it was really a massive transfer of power to the bureaucracy. Obama used that to do things we didn't like. But I think the, the flip side of that coin is that the Trump administration is now going to be able to use some of those same wickets to try to move health care in a more market direction. I think it'll be positive, but I don't think it's a substitute for repealing and replacing Obamacare. And, you know, uh, just to kind of revisit some of the things that the president was just asked about there, uh, let's start with, with Rex Tillerson, because that's really the big, you've got the Iran decertification uh, looming deadline with that. And so these are issues that you would hope the State Department and the White House are yoked on. Does it matter the back and forth to you? Well, here's the thing. The president makes the decisions. I think Secretary Tillerson, if you believe news reports, has been urging caution with respect to the Iran deal. Mm -hmm. I think the president was right in the campaign to say that this was a disastrous deal. Look, the best case scenario with this deal, if we stay in it, five, ten years down the road, we're in the North Korea situation only with Iran, which is a militant Islamic state. So I think we have to find a way to put, put Iran back in the box. Decertification is the first step. It doesn't get us there, but at least it starts the process. I also heard a, a president putting uh, urgency on tax reform. Um, just then as the stock market's hitting record highs today. All right, new developments in the battle over so-called dreamers. Democrats not ruling out withholding support for end-of-the-year budget bills and risking a government shutdown if President Trump and the GOP don't agree to protections <clears throat> for undocumented immigrants brought to the U.S. as children. This after the administration laid out a list of hard-line demands. Nancy Pelosi telling the Washington Post, quote, there's nothing in it to negotiate because it does not have shared values of who we are as Americans. I fully intend to use every possibility, but we're not at that place yet. Right now, we're trying to get Republicans to vote on what we believe. And this from Democrat Luis Gutierrez, one of the president's biggest critics on Dreamers. Quote, I'm not saying we should shut down the government, but if you want a budget with Democratic votes, then it's got to have some Democratic priorities. But the president firing back on Twitter saying the problem with agreeing to a policy on immigration is that the Democrats don't want to secure borders. They don't care about safety for USA. And it appears the president may have most Americans in his corner. A recent poll showing widespread support for his immigration policies. 71% say companies should hire Americans first. More than 80% want stricter penalties on criminal illegals. Three quarters want more ICE officers. And about two out of three want a merit-based green card system. The president's proposals, Congressman, answer a lot of those concerns and, and needs. Yeah, and look, if the Democrats want to shut down the government, because they want to give benefits to people who came illegally, uh, that's a bad political position. That's very. That's in. what Nancy Pelosi is no, talking I know. about. I doing. think that's very bad. And if they do that, I think it'll be tough. The president's priorities that you outlined, the reason why they're popular is because it is putting Americans first. The purpose of immigration policy is to benefit our country and to benefit the folks here. I think somewhere along the line, particularly in the Democratic Party, they've said the purpose of it is to benefit the foreigners who are coming. We have immigration because we think it'll benefit us. And I think Trump is reorienting our policy to focus on the American people. Trish, when Americans are asked, what should the fate of dreamers be? Mm -hmm. uh, this recent poll asked that question, and here are the answers. Stay in U.S. with path to citizenship. Nearly 60% said yes. Mm -hmm. Stay in U.S. legally, but not as citizens. 25% be deported. 12%. So, Sandra, this is important because what it's telling you is that the president is in line with the majority of the country. He's saying, I am offering a path here for dreamers. Now, that should be music to Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer's mm -hmm. ears. This is what they have been looking for. And I don't think he's asking for the moon. He's saying, I want a little bit better 
border security. I want a better green card system that's merit-based. And I want to make sure we crack down on children coming over the border because I'll tell you, that has a whole moral hazard component to it. You allow kids to come here, more will come, and they're put in a very dangerous position. So he's not asking for a ton, and he's saying, I'll give you a path to citizenship as a dreamer. Well, how can they take issue with that? I yeah, mean, it, it, it is a it, good question because, I mean, I, I'm kind of scratching my head. What is the difference between that and amnesty? And I thought Republicans would never go for amnesty. So I don't know how the Democrats don't at least lean in a little bit and take a real hard look at whether they can get bipartisan agreement on this. Jessica, I'll bring you on on this because when you break it down by party, the poll shows this. Those that want the path to citizenship for them, Democrats 72 percent, GOP 42 percent, independents 50 Two percent. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, Democrats and independents are going to be more favorable towards this. This has been a long-time immigration policy of our side, but that's a pretty high Republican number, and we've had a number of GOP senators and congressmen being very outspoken on the fate of the Dreamers. Where I think that the president is making a mistake here is not to do a clean Dreamers bill and then say, hey, look, you got exactly what you wanted. I, too, think that these kids are great kids. They came here no fault of their own. They have a pathway to citizenship or legal status. Now I want to go with my immigration priorities. But they're kind of splitting hairs, the, No, it's I mean, not he's splitting hairs. He's, the, he's, he's giving them the no, path to citizenship. No, he isn't, because he's he just is saying, also going, he's still talking about his wall. He's talking about a merit-based system, which a lot of people have issues with. And you can say they okay. want amnesty. A lot of people do want amnesty. What's wrong with the merit-based <laughs> system? Well, there is the <laughs> argument that it's going to be hurting low-wage skill workers. Right, we have that. We talked about this actually on the couch when Kennedy was here. We actually right. agreed. It'll, it'll at this help. Point. It'll help low blue collar workers because right now so much of our immigration is family based and unskilled, and so that's wages part of the reason up. why we've had blue collar wages. Wages stagnant. will go up they will for go those up. people because but there's a lot of data as many that, says that is Jessica, the case. it seems to me as a country we ought to be prioritizing who we want here and what we need as a country and then we go out and we seek it and we say hey if you're a nurse or you're an engineer or you have these qualifications we want you here well, yes we we're going to make doctors. it easier we that's for we absolutely but why can't we have a clean dreamers bill that that's the question here because that's something that i think there can be bipartisan because agreement on and the president do is trying it all to slip if this you, in if you no, believe we doing know a, how dirty it gets to make last a word to the bill. congressman if you believe doing a naked amnesty will then lead the democrats to want to work with mm. trump on the other stuff i got a bridge in brooklyn I'd like to sell you. <laughs> what, do, what do you think about our new studio, by the way? I think it's phenomenal. It's I think great. it's really crisp. You're happy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's good to have nice. you here. That's All right, great. Dem uh, she's a Democrat. Senator Dianne Feinstein facing growing backlash to her re-election bid from her own party. Why some liberals say it's time for Feinstein to step aside, and if that points to a growing rift. Plus, a Republican senator joining calls for President Trump's cabinet to support his Iran strategy and other priorities or resign? Are some cabinet officials going too far in publicly disagreeing with our president? We debate. Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton now says it's time for President Trump's cabinet officials to support his Iran strategy and other priorities or quit. This comes after Defense Secretary Jim Mattis advocated staying in the Iran nuclear deal and Secretary of State Rex Tillerson admitted differences with the president on this issue. Here's the senator in a podcast interview. When you're a cabinet member, when you're senior advisor in the White House, and the president is right, you should help him achieve his objectives and run with his thinking. When you think the president is wrong, you have a duty to try to present to him the best facts and the best thinking to help him see it in a different light. And maybe you can, but if he doesn't and he says, no, I want to do it my way, then your job is to move out and execute. And if, if you feel strongly enough, then you have to resign. And a former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations talked with me yesterday, and he echoed those comments. He told me that these types of debates should not be held in public and that officials need to stay united with the president and keep it inside the House. Watch. It's a privilege to work for a president in that capacity, and part of that privilege is you give him your absolutely candid, unvarnished advice. He makes the decision, and then you tow the line. And when the time comes that you can't tow the line anymore, you resign. That's the honorable thing to do. 
So, Congressman, actually having a disagreement with the president is not all that big a deal normally, but the idea that people are talking about this outside the House, as Ambassador Bolton put it with me, that is almost untoward. It's not the way it's supposed to go. Senator Cotton's exactly right. Um, you don't have to agree with the president. You're there to offer advice, and you can make your case. If he disagrees with you, then you have to do what he has ordered you to do. That's the way the government works. And if you can't do that, then I agree with Senator Cotton, and then you should resign. Um, there's sometimes when you be executing policies you may disagree with, but maybe it doesn't rise to the level of resignation. Maybe you just do it. Mm -hmm. But if it's impeding your ability to do the best job you can, then let somebody else do it. Specifically, though, on Iran decertification, which, you know, does not mean that we're going to walk away from this deal. It means that certain things will be put into place and it falls more on the hands of Congress. Uh, I don't want to put anybody down here, but Congress has not moved very quickly on certain items. If it lands in your hands as the total Congress, what do you think happens? Well, I think we should take it and move to impose significant sanctions. And you have on faith Iran. that as a body you can get it done. I mean, well, you can only a, speak for yourself. That is a much different question. Um, <laughs> right. I think the House would probably pass it. I mean, obviously, it's very difficult to predict the Senate doing anything productive at this point. Um, but I think that decertification Ouch. is kind of the first step. But if you really want to put Iran back in the box, it is going to take action by the Congress. And it's going to take action by the president to work with some of our allies. You know, some of our allies in Europe, they make money off Iran. They're not necessarily in Iran's but crosshairs. Wait, so there's a lot of disagree not, disagreement, I'm told, is not exactly the right word by some of uh, the pres people closest to the president, but there is differing views as to how to proceed with Iran, and you've got Mattis presenting one view, uh, General Dunford presenting another, you stay in it for the best, na uh, for our national security, while the president's saying, this is the worst deal I've ever seen. And so, the president wh ran, he, he made that exact case to the American people, Hillary was was on stage defending the Iran deal. The American people uh, sided with him in, in that dispute. I mean, the Iran deal has never been popular. People realize it's problematic. So I think those officials can give their advice. But at the end of the day, I think the president has charted They're a course still support and they have to that we job. cannot abide by gotcha. this deal anymore. So, Trish, you know, along the lines of what the congressman is saying, it was almost a referendum that the American people gave on this issue. Sure. We, sure. we don't still totally know what's in that deal. It, it, Americans don't like the deal. I mean, I think all the polling data showed that. And of course, Donald Trump won the White House, uh, so that in some ways showed that. And Iran was a component of that. Look, you know, in terms of the administration, it's kind of like, you know, you think about it at home, right? We, a lot of us have kids here, and it, you need to be a united front. You and your husband, right? Sandra, yeah. are a united front when sometimes, it comes to those little Sometimes lives. you play bad cop, good cop. And, I'm just saying it works. And so I think that's also just the kind of image that this administration is, needs to give out. So if you're Rex Tillerson, yes, you may disagree. And you go have that conversation, and you do so privately. But whatever the president decides, and I think he welcomes a diversity of opinion, which is great, mm -hmm. but once he makes a decision, you are on board, uh -oh. you are part of the team, and you head. follow the captain. Yeah, you know what's interesting? Let's, let's not miss the timing of the president's meeting today with Dr. Henry Kissinger, who knows how to bring some people together, right? I, I, we don't know in totality what they right. talked about, only what the pool reporters asked that they talked about. But, but it is interesting, that timing, because that is a gentleman who could help you navigate. Absolutely. I think that was smart, and it's also a good PR move for him today to be sitting up there with kind of a grand statesman. But what do I say to your point? It would be great if the White House could be a united front. But I think that these disagreements have gotten so out of control and that we do have a president who treats the media and cyberspace differently than presidents before him. He's totally willing to go on Twitter and take down one people of his People call own. that transparency, by the way. Yeah, those people and I should have some words. I, that is not transparency. It's inappropriate. I mean, the a comments about whether, you know, Tillerson called him a moron or not. And, you know, I think that a person like General Mattis obviously feels that he has been pushed to the brink, that he would make a public announcement like that when he knows that it runs counter to what the well, president we, says. We don't know how he feels. Maybe it's part of a strategy. I want to give here, you a here's, my, here's my thing with the Iran, though. You knew how the president felt about this. This isn't like this is a new issue. I can understand if it's a new issue and you disagree. But you know, Donald you Trump didn't get elected job, because of the Iran deal. They took the I job mean. knowing what his position was on Iran. And if that was going to be a problem for them, then that was something I think that should have been considered going Absolutely. in. Absolutely, right. but if it's a significant issue, Donald gets Trump won. Okay, bye. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Senator Dianne Feinstein has announced her re-election bid for 2018. Some progressives say they are not happy, and now there's a movement to find a primary challenge 
challenger to go up against her. Jessica is ready to talk already. Her head is shaking. <laughs> well, whether Feinstein should run again or make room for new leadership, we keep having this conversation among the Democrats. And Steve Bannon is saying he's going to support a wave of anti-establishment Republican candidates at 18. He wants to unseat every senator up for re-election except for one. Well, who's that? We'll talk about it. Former White House Chief Strategist Steve Bannon gearing up for a major fight in the midterms. He says he's going to back primary challengers to every Republican senator up for re-election in 2018, except for one. Watch what he told Sean Hannity. That's when I left the White House. Remember, I said, I'm going after the Republican establishment, and we're going to go after them. We're going to challenge as a coalition. Give me the states. Go. There's a coalition coming together that's going to challenge every Republican incumbent except for Ted Cruz. We are declaring war on the Republican establishment that does not back the agenda that Donald Trump ran on. When you want to talk about why there's no repeal and replace, why there's no tax cut, why there's no tax reform, why there's no infrastructure bill, you saw it right there. Corker, McConnell and Corker and the entire clique, establishment globalist clique on Capitol Hill have to go. Declaring war on the Republican establishment. Is this a good idea, Congressman? Well, I, I, I agree with what he said about, you know, why hasn't the party been able to get more done? And in the past, it was, oh, we got all these cantankerous conservatives. They're too principled. They don't compromise. Actually, what you found is repeal and replace and things like that. That's failing because the old guard establishment Republicans aren't able to deliver on promises that we've made for seven years. So I think tax reform really could be the Waterloo for the Republican Ooh. establishment. If we're passing it out of the House and the mm. conservatives in the Senate are supporting it, which I think they will, but you're losing some of these old guard uh, establishment inside type Republicans, then I think the fuel uh, for Bannon's fire is gonna rage even more. And the American people, particularly Republican voters, they want to see stuff get done and they want to see the senators focus on legislation and not constantly sniping at the president. Could this backfire, though, Jessica, this strategy? I hope so, but I'm worried that we're eating each other alive anyway, so we might not even be uh, able to take advantage of it. You mean you, the Democrats? Yes, I am the whole party right now. We didn't we yes. just wanted to clarify it wasn't the couch. No, no, no the couch is all good. Because <laughs> we're all happy. And the lighting's so nice here. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think that it will be a difficult road for Republicans. Obviously, these fissures already existed. Donald Trump took advantage of them to win the presidency. Um, I'm glad to see Lion Ted has got himself a spot on the safe deck, though. Uh, somehow, out of all of this, it was his number one uh, hated person during the uh, campaign well, for well, Trump. Keep in mind the Mercer connection there, though, right? The Mercer Never forget the Mercer very, connection. Uh, very favorable to Ted Cruz, and they are tight with Well, they were with so Mer help, Mercer's help back, Ted Cruz first. Mm -hmm. But you know what, Congressman, when it comes to tax reform, I was reading this morning that it might not be that block of establishment uh, leadership that might block that. It, it could be somebody like a Rand Paul who says there's no way he's signing on to the tax cuts the way that right. they are now. I mean, there, there could be other problems within the party. How does the president deal with that? Is he going to fight with everybody? And you know what? By the way, it does work for him. It may not work for everybody. Right. right. But, but anybody who goes up against him, I mean, they rue the day. Here's what I know. I, the House will pass a tax reform. You'll get almost unani unanimous support from conservatives in the House. Um, we'll and probably some Democrats. Lose I hope so, Maybe. but we'll see. And then it'll go to the Senate. And I think all the key conservatives from Ted Cruz on will support the tax package. And so I think the key numbers are going to be more in the moderate establishment lane. And I think that here's the thing when they say that there's divisions in the party. The biggest division is between the Washington Republican Party and our entire voter base. It's not like half the room in a Republican uh, fundraising dinner supports the establishment. Mm. They all think these guys haven't do haven't answered wow. their promises. That's so it's a it's an alienation where you have the leadership in Washington is just not in sync with the voter base, and you got to find a sync. But, but this is happening in both parties. Let's not forget. I mean, we're seeing a real shift here away from these parties, and people are saying, "Hey, I want what's best for me." Right? You know, who cares about whether it's a Republican or Democrat principle? They want what's best for me, for them, for the country. And so that's that's very much a shift. And that could play very much into Steve Bannon's mm. hands. People have had it with Washington, mm. both sides, whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats. So this is 
very fertile territory for him and for the right. president. Let's pick up there. Uh, we could see a major primary challenge on the left as well. California Senator Dianne Feinstein has announced that she will seek re-election in 2018. Um, she will be 85 years old, and some progressives are not on board. Congressman Ro uh, Khanna of California is one of them. He says it's time for Democrats to move on to better represent uh, grassroots. Politico is reporting he's urging Congresswoman Barbara Lee of California and former Secretary of Labor Robert Reich, who served under Bill Clinton, to go up against Feinstein in a primary. No word on whether they will do so. So, Jessica? Your, your thoughts? I think there definitely will be a primary challenge. I think that it's unfortunate that we've seen Dianne Feinstein's age splattered everywhere when Orrin Hatch is 83, Chuck Grassley's 83. Can we make Senator it about like, ideas? Because that's oh, what's no, we happening can, but that's what people are using. No, no, but Pelosi. people are using that against yeah. her, and I think that that's unfortunate. Uh, what I would say about the ideas, I understand California is probably, you know, I mean, definitely top five most progressive states in the country. She is more moderate and centrist. That's also how she's been able to accomplish so much, again, throughout her storied career. When they say that she's too pro-Trump, just the fact that she will have a conversation with a Republican does not mean that you are pro-Trump. She has been scathing about the president and about many members of the Republican House uh, and Senate. I, I think that this is unfortunate to air our dirty laundry this way as well. Mm. And that it's kind a of primary though. challenge would be very ugly. We've seen it twice in a week, Congressman. We saw, uh, who was it, uh, Linda Sanchez mm -hmm. among the Republic, uh, re among the Democrats, rather, come out and say we need to replace certain members of your party, like right. Nancy Pelosi. Age wasn't brought up, but it it's is up. her fifth term. If she, so that's another well, number that they're bringing up if she decides. And that's to why run. I think this is a perfect time to discuss term limits. We need mm -hmm. term limits for members of Congress. The fact of the matter is once people get in there, they really can become entrenched. And it's not really about age as much as it's about how long have you festered in the swamp mm -hmm. for. A different and number. I think it would be great uh, to have term it's, limits. The president supports blood, it. It's fresh blood, but it's fresh thinking as well. I mean, don't we talk about Democrats almost every single day, Jessica, still don't have a message? Well, the two sides of them each have their own message, and that's the problem. You have the Bernie Sanders faction, and they know what they want, and you have the centrist faction, which was led by Hillary Clinton, and they know what they want. The problem is, is we don't want to split our own votes. So I totally agree with you. I think it should be an economic message because that unifies everybody, right? Mm. We're going to put more money in your pocket. Which economic mm. message? Well, <laughs> well, well, well it's right. Which one do you have right? Rice's economic message would be, you work hard, Jessica, <laughs> and I'm going to give it to everybody else. Um, so you don't want that. But that's a popular message, and it's one that Donald Trump also okay, so, fair point. So, so based on what you just said, does this push Democrats farther to the left then? Oh, it definitely does. But the problem is, is that when people show up at the polls, mm -hmm. I don't know how much they're going to go along with that. Whether you like it or not, and whether the DNC stole the primary for Hillary, the Americans on the whole are much more centrist than the far left of our party. I mean, the map lit up red. So the idea that you'd be pushing out moderates mm -hmm. who can speak to the other side at this moment makes no sense to me. I think it's also just a terrible PR move. Like, stop Is doing it this. Is it just happenstance that those moderates are a bit younger? I mean, I, I know we don't want to lean in too hard the on, the, on the 85 number uh, for the, the age of Dianne Feinstein or anybody else's age, but let's just do it in a generational point then. Yeah. It seems like those young Younger generations are also along the lines of what might be more well, totally. attractive in terms get of older, ideas they for your typically party. on both sides get more conservative. That, that's a fact. I do understand the new blood argument. I thought it was important that Ted Ryan challenged Nancy Pelosi mm -hmm. to just at least put it out there that we are having these divisions. I, I just hate to see well, someone Linda like Linda Sanchez isn't getting any love. People in no. your party are upset with her about the timing zone and so forth. I want to give again the congressman the last point, though. Um, you know, Republicans take a lot of criticism, but look at what's happening in the Democratic House. I'll tell you, I've noticed since Trump got elected, there's been a, a very strong movement to the left uh, within the Democratic Party. You see it in the House on, on how they, they vote and behave on certain things. And um, on one hand, there's going to be people that are really energized by that that will probably come out to vote for him in the midterm. On the other hand, I think they've narrowed the appeal of the party, which obviously had a difficult time outside the coast in appealing to the American mm -hmm. people. So, uh, But the generational point you made is key. If you look at the Senate, we've been having problems with the Republican Senate. Most of the senators have been elected since 2010. They're reformers by and large. They want to see some mm -hmm. change. It's more of the old guard, I think, who's holding it back. Yeah, yeah. that's an interesting Term limits. Point. There you go. Yeah. I wrote it down in caps, those congressional term limits. Anyway, amid growing tensions with North Korea, now Defense Secretary Mattis is warning the military must stand ready if diplomacy falls short. Whether that means we are entering more dangerous territory and what the U.S. options really are, we'll talk about it. Stay close.
Secretary Jim Mattis warning the U.S. Army to be prepared in the face of continued provocations by North Korea. The general saying diplomacy and sanctions remain the strategy for now, but also noting that could change. Watch. What does the future hold? Neither you nor I can say. So there's one thing the U.S. Army can do, and that is you have got to be ready to ensure that we have military options that our president can employ if needed. Mattis's remarks come as Army Chief of Staff Mark Milley says there are no risk-free options in dealing with the regime. Meanwhile, the University of Hawaii reportedly sending an ominous email to students with tips on how to respond in the unlikely event of a nuclear attack or radiation emergency, including information on shelters. So, Congressman, you know, I realize that, you know, and, and none of us wants this, but I realize at some point we might find ourselves with only the military option as a possibility. But I think there is a big, long distance between here and there. And I want to know from you whether you are convinced we are doing enough to push China to start to push for our agenda in North Korea. Well, in terms of the military option, I mean, speaking to the, the Army, like, yeah, they always need to be prepared. I don't think that's indicative of they're going to be launching operations. I mean, even if you did do a kinetic operation, it would probably be more Navy and Air Force Base trying to take out his uh, weapons of mass destruction. Um, so are we doing enough with China? Um, I think the president's done a lot. Uh, he's done a lot with other countries to try to starve Kim, uh, Kim's regime of money, and it's actually been successful. But I'm not talking about starving Kim's regime of money. I'm talking about starving China of well, money. I'm taking it a step that, further yeah, if here. If that's because the way to get to them to shut off the spigot, because what's going to happen is if you could shut off the spigot, he's not then just going to give up his weapons, but I think it creates instability in the regime. If his regime starts to buckle, mm -hmm. that is probably the best way to deal with the weapons problem is to have Kim's regime just implode mm -hmm. so we don't need to use the military So option. let's talk about instability for a second, because I've wondered, and I, Trish, I think this is where you're going, I've wondered why we don't just pull the rug out from China right now. Like, what are we waiting for? What are the risks? Is it because it would cause instability in the region, not just for North Korea, or what is the reason? It's economic. You know, it's economic. I've asked this question to so many guests on the show, and they keep telling me, oh, well, we can't afford it. I mean, we have way too many big companies that are doing business in China and are too reliant on that economy, and China obviously so has these ties with us. Is there more to it? So I, I think that is part of it. I mean, if you take negative action against China, that could also affect us negatively, which yeah. we just don't want that to happen. They hold our debt. So I think they. they've, the president's been working this. You have seen more and more done, not enough done, but I think they can, I think they feel that if they're showing a credible threat of force, if they're working with a lot of other countries to try to starve the Kim regime of money, that they can bring China along. Look, maybe that'll happen, maybe it won't, but, but it's a, it's but a difficult left, thing. We're left sitting here, and I'm sure people sitting at home with this, this fear of what happens next with North Korea. I mean, are we looking at a military conflict more likely? This is a pretty strong warning coming from Secretary Mattis. Be ready, he's telling the military. So here's what I would say. There are things that you can do to try to neutralize Kim's weapons short of a major military action. We have covert means, we have electronic means. Um, I know the president is getting briefed on that and, and give, being given options. So, so that could happen. We may not even know what's happening when it's happening. Obviously, when you start talking about beyond that, a kinetic strike, uh, we could take out what Kim's weapons, we could do that, our military's what happens in response? And mm. can you neutralize the response that you would get from Kim mm. Jong-un, not against the United States, but against Seoul, against Japan? And he has the potential to do an awful lot of damage. And so that's why, in this case, the stakes of military action are just a lot higher mm. than they have been in some of our other recent conflicts. Well, I, I keep getting told that China has both the intelligence um, and uh, sort of the wherewithal to make some changes there, uh, and that Kim Jong-un is there in part because China allows him to be there, to which I keep going back to sanctions on China. Fine, you need to start looking at uh, sanctions on North Korea. Fine, you need to start looking at sanctions on China. Uh, and we have sanctioned one Chinese bank, but that may not be enough. I mean, the reality is I think we would all rather lose dollars than lives here. President Trump praising Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones for saying he will not tolerate his players kneeling during the national anthem. Has the president won this debate? That's next.
President Trump praising Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones for announcing he will not tolerate his players kneeling during the national anthem. Trump tweeting this. A big salute to Jerry Jones, owner of the Dallas Cowboys, who will bench players who disrespect our flag. Stand for anthem or sit for game. This coming one day after Vice President Mike Pence walked out of an NFL game after several players, about 20 of them, took a knee during the anthem. Now ESPN host Stephen A. Smith admitting he believes President Trump is winning this fight. He's turned it into uh, an issue about patriotism and beyond. Uh, he's catering to his base in the process. But he is the one that's winning because he's turned this into something that the players didn't intend to. So they're going to have to find a different level, a different mechanism to make their voices heard because Trump has won this round. Wow. I'm, I'm going to just let let that lie in your lap, Congressman. <laughs> well, look, I, and I was a baseball player growing up, Little League through college. For every game, you do the national anthem. When I was in the Navy, every morning starts with colors, it ends with colors. You stand and salute the flag. And now in Congress, I'll go speak to veterans groups. So we'll be up with a bunch of, say, World War II or Korean veterans. They want you to stand. Do you think for the, the NFL anthem. misread their audience? Of course they did. And the thing is, the NFL, I don't understand their view on this. They will suppress player speech. You can't um, celebrate in the end zone. If you wanted to honor the slain Dallas police officers, won't let you do it. Breast cancer awareness, no, no, no. But. We believe it's your free speech to protest the national anthem. So the NFL made a conscious decision to restrict a lot of speech other ways, which they can do because it's a private league, um, but then to basically endorse these protests. And I think it was a major miscalculation. And this all goes back to Sunday night, right, mm -hmm. Trish, when we saw Mike Pence, the vice president, walk out of that 49ers mm -hmm. Colts game with his wife. Mm -hmm. And that took another turn in this whole oh, story. Look, I mean, I... I as vice president, that's not going to sit well with you. As someone who is, uh, has formerly been in the military or currently in the military, it's not going to sit well with you. I think just as an American, I mean, you know, look, I mean, there are a few things, right, that where you just start to get the chills and the shivers. And, you, you know, it, it, when you hear, or at least when I hear the national anthem, when I used to say, I used to be a singer, so I'd sing the national anthem. And, and to this day, when I do or when I hear it, you just feel this tremendous sense of patriotism. And I think there's just sort of a core emotional response that most of us have, which is why people have gotten so angry about and this. And I would say, you know what, that guy was right. The president did win on this because Americans mm. have been turning off football. Mm. And imagine when you're at the sports sporting events too, it's special because sometimes for the big games, They'll buzz the Jets over there as the anthem's end, and everyone, it's just a great time uh, for I don't think anyone pride. is disputing the value of the national anthem or what it symbolizes. As Stephen A. Smith pointed out, that the president has won this because he has distorted what the original protest was about. And Colin Kaepernick actually spoke to veterans groups to talk to them about what he should do, because initially he sat, if you recall, and then he moved to kneeling. What I would say that's is interesting that, about that this... That was when he had the pigs on his socks. Listen, Colin to... Kaepernick is an imperfect messenger, to be sure. I, I just want to clarify that this did not start out as I don't like the flag, I don't like the national anthem. What I find interesting about this, Jerry Jones is a hero for this. I mean, the NFL lets people who are domestic abusers play, mm -hmm. steroid users, mm -hmm. accused murderers, mm -hmm. accused rapists. And this is the most offensive thing that happens, that they take a knee. Why don't we go after all of them? Why well, doesn't Jerry Jones perhaps, care about that? Perhaps that's Roger Goodell's fault. I mean, Roger Goodell There's has a lot been that's Roger overseeing Goodell's this fault. league and has allowed that. I agree with you. I was very outspoken. I didn't like you. Remember yes. Ray Rice? Um, th there's no place for that. In, in this sport, absolutely not. I agree. You shouldn't be allowing them to and play. And I think that when, when those, you have, but then you would when, have, when you I mean, have that, you I think. the numbers of people if, in all those categories, and the list could go on. You would end up with very few people who could be out there. Well, the, the, but, you know, I, I don't think that's fair to all the players, but there are, you're right, well, there are some of those players, issues who I think that they should be tough on that. I think the fans don't like to see bad people out on the field to cheer for bad people. You want to cheer for good people. So I think, but the, the, the flag is the same thing. It's harder to cheer for people who are going to disrespect our national symbol. You can but have your political agenda, who don't find, think a different, it is well, find a different a way to channel it uh, rather than choosing to protest the flag. Um, it just, just doesn't make I sense. I just can't wait to get back to the day where we all know we stand, we put our hands on our hearts, yeah. we take our hats off and we get those chilling yeah, you moments. You I think it's By the way, long time. little known fact about Trish, trained opera singer. One <laughs> yes. day we'll what get you to sing the national What more could she do? Oh, there you go. <laughs> I would love that. All right, more outnumbered in just a moment.
The Daily Briefing with Dana Perino live today from the George W. Bush Presidential Library in Dallas, Texas. Dana will be sitting down with former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and the former First Lady Laura Bush. That's all happening today at 2 p.m. Eastern. That is can't miss television right there. Congressman Ron DeSantis, thanks for being here. Thank you, guys. Wonderful hour. Good time. I think we covered a lot, don't you think? Yeah. 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 We got everywhere. Yeah. Big we hour, busy hour. All right, we're back tomorrow at noon Eastern, outnumbered overtime with Harris Faulkner starts right now.